Welcome to the show. Thanks for tuning in. Today's guest is Randy Dickinson, Chair of the Premier's Council on Disabilities. Randy has a long history of this province worth working in that area, so I'm hoping all the stories from the past will come up and the directions for the future. Thanks for taking the time, Randy. Well, thank you, Dennis, for providing a forum where people get to chat about things in a little more detail and depth, <laughs> and maybe we can share a few ideas and concepts that might be of interest to your audience. Okay. I want to do this almost for me for fun. So we first met, you might not remember, in 1985. I was doing Special Olympics, yes. and you were doing Premier's Council on Disabled back then. And it was the Canada Games hosted down in St. Yeah. John. And yeah. you and I met at a meeting one time, not knowing each other, about, um, at that time, Premier Hatfield won in two demonstration races with uh, athletes. So there were mm -hmm. special O athletes, and then some of your gang, I think it was probably wheelchair. Wheelchair sports, athletes, yeah. yeah. So, and at the time, Rick Hansen was um, more or less doing his thing through. Mm -hmm. And now we're at 2019. Mm -hmm. So that's quite the stretch. Do you have any high points or successes that you thought were, were finally making the change? Because in some ways, nothing much has changed, and we'll get to that in a, in a second. Well, it's like that uh, line in the book there, it was the best of times and the worst of times. <laughs> Certainly in the time, you know, I've been involved as a disability advocate probably now over 40 years, and I live with a disability myself, so I have a personal perspective on how people interact with people with disabilities as well as the professional and volunteer work I've done. And I would certainly say, like when I grew up as a youngster in Upper Woodstock, you know, people with disabilities were not seen out and about. They were literally kept in the back rooms and they didn't attend public school if they had a, a significant disability and because they didn't interact with people there was a lot of uh, misinformation and stereotypes and myths about uh, people with disabilities. I think the biggest uh, claim to fame that New Brunswick can make is the uh, policy of inclusion in the public schools when they closed down. Like in Woodstock we had the Peter Pan School for the Mentally Retarded and now kids with disabilities go to the same schools as other children. They get a chance not only so much for the academic uh, curriculum and the opportunity to prepare themselves for the job market if they're able, mm. but also the social interaction with their peers so that when they grow up with their neighbors, kids, uh, those kids will become the employers and the politicians and the business people uh, of the future making decisions about public policy and they're going to know John and Susan and uh, yep. uh, uh, Peggy all the people with disabilities they grew up with and they're not going to be uh, satisfied if they're not included in the community in all aspects of community life so that transition into inclusion in the public schools then paved the way for more uh, students with disabilities going on to post-secondary education and other training opportunities that really enabled them to increase the rate of participation in the workforce. Hmm. We're not where we need to be yet, <laughs> for sure, in terms of employment yeah. of persons with disabilities. Hmm. But like I said, uh, with the new technology and with the right supportive environment, pretty well anyone with any type of disability mm -hmm. could theoretically uh, be employed and uh, be contributing to the economy of the province and the country and be more uh, uh, self-sustaining in their own lives because, you know, you need money if you want to be able to participate in social and recreational activities, yep. transportation, decent diet, a decent place to live, and what have you. And mm -hmm. I, I'm excited about that. And like I said, the other thing about the technology, it is so f uh, much improved the quality of life. Uh, for example, a blind person now can interact with a computer and be employed in handling the same information that you and I would look on the screen with voice recognition uh, technology. Yeah. Uh, they can be as productive and work as fast and, and, and deal with the same type of material that any other co-worker would be dealing with. When as years ago, that was not possible mm. and and the uh, uh, mobility aids and devices that you know some can I have a scooter for example can go apart and put in the trunk for regular car so if we travel somewhere we don't need to rent a van with a lift which I usually use with my wheelchair yeah uh, because we can take it apart and throw it in the back of a taxi or, or a rental car mm. and uh, and still have the mobility device I need to be able to get out and about when we're uh, traveling uh, you know elsewhere mm. so those sorts of things have improved and we have seen um, uh, you know, more, I think, awareness in general about people with disabilities. But, you know, the sad part is, you know, we still have a long ways to go if we mm -hmm. want to have 
equitable opportunity for people with different types of disabilities to be uh, employed, to get an access to proper education, to have decent housing, and to afford the daily necessities of, of life. And too many people are with disabilities are living in poverty. They're on social assistance with, you know, dismal uh, benefits and, and lack of opportunity to be creative because the rules and regulations actually create barriers to becoming more self-sufficient and I think we can do a better job and and here in Fredericton, for example, I roam around town, and, and if I wanted to go in a rest, there's a lot of downtown places, even though Fredericton is more accessible than some other communities. There's a lot of places downtown I just can't get into. Or if I go to a restaurant with my wife and want to use the washroom, they say, well, we don't have an accessible washroom, but there's a restaurant a block down the street that you could go to. Well, if I'm going to use the, the restaurant washroom a block down the street, that's mm -hmm. where I want to go and shop. And most people are surprised when I talk about the, the data about the rate of incidence of disability. In New Brunswick, 26.7% of the population of New Brunswick have at least one disability that they're dealing with. And if you just stop and think about that, if you're a businessman uh, with a, a restaurant or if you're a hotel uh, deciding on the design of your rooms and meeting uh, spaces, if you're not able to accommodate that type of uh, need, you're not just losing out the business of that person with the disability, but like mm. if we have a birthday party with the family, we've got a big family, you know, mm. 30, 40, 50 people go out to a party. Well, <laughs> I need the accessible restaurant for yeah. me to get in, yeah. but they're getting 40 other customers that yeah. will come with me if, if, I, if I can get in. Isn't it fascinating how the, because the economic argument is really important, but it, it still hasn't gotten over the hump somehow. I don't know quite how to describe yeah. it, but you're still fighting many of the same battles as in the mid 80s or mid 90s. Yeah. So maybe it boils down to a mindset rather than um, um, resources, you know? And, yeah. and is that, do we need to shift the conversation somewhere more towards general wellness rather than project management? Or if we throw money at this and that's fixed now, and, but it's not fixed now because we never got at the heart of it. And sometimes your conversations lend me into looking at it that way. It's like this man has committed so much to this province over such a period of time. And some of the stories are pretty similar to the 80s and 90s. Yes, there's been some changes, but the heart of it somehow still isn't an awareness that we're really talking about wellness. And the wellness goes to the whole thing. It includes the wellness of the economy, the wellness of the individual's quality of life, mm -hmm. the wellness of what a community is and how it can foster and nurture all these relationships. Well, I'll tell you, uh, for years, the, you know, the argument was, you know, human rights yes. argument and, the, you know, the right thing to do. And, uh, you know, if you're preaching to the converted in the nonprofit sector or disability organization, of course, everybody's convinced you're, you don't have to educate them about that. But when you talk about the private sector and, and also government to a large extent, I found much more success in recent, recent years when we use the economic empowerment argument to, to not only to uh, point out the uh, market share that a significant number of people who have disabilities represent, but their family and neighbors and friends that would join with them in supporting businesses. And if your uh, uh, restaurant or store or, or hotel is accessible for a guest or a customer and you can serve them, you also create an environment that would be open to employment uh, opportunities for people with different disabilities. So I find when I talk to business groups and, and you know, like the Chamber of Commerce, whatever, when we talk about human rights argument of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, yeah. you know, everybody's smiling and <laughs> their eyes are glazing over. But when I talk about 27.7, 7, 26.7% of the population yeah. having a disability and think about their family and their friends and, and, and going to, like if I have a conference that has to have a hotel that needs three or four rooms that are accessible, but I'm bringing 500 delegates to your hotel uh, who don't have a disability, business people then can see it makes good economic sense for them to invest in the uh, ergonomic changes that would enable people to mm. participate. And it does come back to your concept of, because wellness is a bigger concept of not just the economy, but as yeah. you say, personal wellness. If people don't have enough uh, uh, employment or income from whatever source to, to sustain themselves in a healthy, uh, positive way, 
they end up costing the system a lot more in different budgets. It could be the healthcare system, uh, you know, premature hospitalization and chronic uh, disease or disability getting unnecessarily worse, mm. or it could be the criminal justice system where people with mental health problems or, or other learning disabilities, for example, a lot of studies in Canada show that the prison population in Canada is actually made up significantly of people with learning disabilities and mental health uh, issues who didn't get the proper supports and it costs a heck of a lot more to keep somebody in jail or prison for a year than what we give people to live in the community <laughs> to, yeah, yeah. to be independent, <clears throat> self-sufficient and connected with their peers. So let's play with that a little bit. Um, would the notion of a guaranteed annual income help with some of the challenges you watch uh, that population have to deal with? That's one idea and I think I'm not sure if the country yet is ready to accept that sort of a big social policy step mm -hmm. but one of the things we're advocating for at the Premier's Council for example we'd like this Department of Social Development to create a different category of social assistance benefits call it a disability benefit program so that if the client on social assistance had a moderate or severe level of disability. For example, they could have different rules around two people sharing a housing costs without affecting their benefits. It costs the government nothing, but it would mean that those two individuals could first of all increase the standard of living that they could afford with their joint uh, housing project. They could also provide emotional support and maybe even physical assistance with doing the chores of daily living, helping each other be more independent self-sufficient yeah. and also preventing depression and loneliness and that sort of thing or if they could earn more employment income even if it's regular part-time employment without yeah. having their social assistance yeah. clawed back again raising their standard of living without costing government more or uh, you know keeping their health card if they get a job with a, an yeah. employer who doesn't have health insurance they can't afford to take that. My wheelchair, for example, costs $10,000. I have health insurance. But if you don't have health insurance, yeah. how long would it take you to save up $10,000 yeah. to, yeah. to have a, a chair? So these are things we think government could do that would drastically improve the quality of yeah. life for people with disabilities. And I think the public on that type of initiative would be highly supportive as opposed to say the guaranteed annual income which I personally support yeah. but I don't think the the public has yeah. got its mind around that sort yeah. of uh, general uh, uh, yeah. income stability but I think for people with disabilities they could yeah part of me part of me feels really sad that you still have to make that conversation you still have to make that argument it's on the surface, it's too much common sense. Of course, it needs to be structured a different yeah. way. And But you still have to kind of bang the same issues the same way that, because if we do this here, then this gets better here, this gets, yes, that's that's like good for anybody. But you, for some reason, you, you still have to kind of get that message out there and get it across. It's not self-evident truth and something that's in practice yet. And the issue on um, a guaranteed annual income and maybe a bigger audience, um, one of the things that's slowly surfacing in the narrative is the role of money. So we've kind of treated, generalizing, yeah. we've kind of treated money as something that you store. Um, so it gets packed away in offshore accounts. We need to accumulate it and hang on to it and stuff. But money has a second role, which is in, in flow, in distribution. Money is a form of energy. Mm -hmm. And we've gone too far down one road where it's all being stored up and it's not in flow anymore. And guaranteed annual incomes, um, when they were done as pilot projects in the 70s, um, I'm stealing the material from Carlos Gomez in my right. interview with yes. Carlos yes. four yeah. or five years ago because um, we were mainly talking about spiritual journeys and making drums. But the first 20 minutes were about he being the lead project person in northern New Brunswick on Mark Lalonde's strategy yes. for doing guaranteed annual income in certain communities as a pilot project. Yeah. And if I remember Carlos correctly, he said it worked great. People had more money in their pockets. They distributed it. Um, there's a book out called Utopia for Pragmatists or something, and it speaks to all these studies that were done. It works, like there's been enough work done, but emotionally, there's something that still stops a community or a society from making that decision. Well, well, well it's, it's interesting you say that, but, but I think there's other bigger issues as well in terms, for example, current government taxation policy that really doesn't encourage uh, 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 large corporations or wealthy <laughs> individuals to pay a fair share of uh, their revenue instead of, as you say, 
putting it offshore where there, I don't understand how that's been allowed to uh, uh, continue for as long as it has because it, it really, I mean, it doesn't mean we're trying to say that uh, uh, rich people should not have any income and reward for their a efforts, yeah. but it shouldn't be such a gap between the, the very small percentage at the top and the majority of people. And when you look at people with disabilities, as we say, statistically, if they have little income, if their income is dependent on pensions or social yeah. assistance, or they're working a, 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 an entry level position, they just don't have the extra funds to cover the extra costs relating to disability. Yep. And on tax policy, for example, you can make a donation to a political party and you get a lot more tax benefit as a tax credit than you do, for example, what I pay out of pocket for my wheelchair batteries or prescription drugs or whatever. Yep. The medical expense deduction or the disability deduction is far less than what the politicians reward themselves for people donating to them. So I think, again, there's elements of public policy and, and part of the problem there is you get we educate and, and advocate with governments and bureaucrats and then there's a change of government and uh, a change of focus again and you have to almost start all over again in the uh, building the infrastructure and networking of uh, people who might be receptive to yeah. s uh, significant change and I think unfortunately you know, I, I'm a proud New Brunswicker, but I think the reality is, you know, uh, New Brunswickers seem to be quite uh, difficult to move on substantive change. And it's whether it's social policy, or economic policy, or what have you. And for people with disabilities, like I said, we've made significant pro progress. When I look back, to, like I said, when I was a kid, yes, we've made a lot of progress. Yep. But when I see where I want to be, and I look, for example, the federal legislation on accessibility that was passed in June, and most pro uh, uh, provinces have started to work on provincial legislation. We're trying to get our province on board as well and have standards that would be the same across the country yep. and not just the federal legislation covers stuff under federal jurisdiction we need provincial legislation for items and, and issues under provincial jurisdiction and if we get the legislative framework we need whether it's accessibility legislation employment uh, changes and the uh, taxation policy those are, are better uh, uh, tactics to get a systemic change to the quality of life and the outcomes not only for citizens with disabilities, but for the for the general average uh, people out there who are taxpayers and citizens who deserve a decent quality of life, uh, you know, as a as a human right, in my opinion, compared to say, you know, putting ninety eight percent of the wealth in in the hands of two percent of the population. <laughs> yeah, distribution challenges, yeah, you know, yeah. uh, which means it's got to take a mindset shift or a heart set shift. Yeah. Um, there's this lovely um, TED talk from ages ago, um, Dan Pink, and it's What Motivates People. Mm -hmm. It was one of the first ones that RSL Animate came along. You know when they do the dry erase yes. board and they draw yes. really quickly and, and they make it match? So you can see either or on YouTube. Um, and he narrows down, he goes through all these business arguments about what motivates people. And you would think it would be pay or salary and okay. stuff. In short, there's three things, you know, autonomy, and you've spoken very passionately about yeah. autonomy, um, contribution to community, and mastery, like to be able to, you know, why do we play guitars? And we're not going to make a living playing guitar. We just like to learn it to our yeah. garden. So somewhere in there, that's the human experience. And that becomes the social human experience. And I keep wondering if, if we can get the conversation down to the common denominators that touch all of us, like you do so well, then maybe the shift can occur there because you were, you were so diplomatic about how New Brunswick in some ways is stuck, like I'll say it. <laughs> you don't, you don't, it's like there's something about us and our culture so far, and I don't mean that in a negative way, it's an observation, it's an awareness. We, we seem to be, re we come right up to the edge of doing something, and it, oh, we've never done it this way before, and we stop. Some of it's human nature, and some of it's our culture. But, uh, uh, whether it's forestry, whether it's how we manage water yes, or don't manage water, yes. whether it's how we generate um, um, wealth, because we still think the industrial model yes. instead of all these other models yes. are available. All this new technology available for you, there's a whole different quality of life available, and we're not implementing it. We're not over that cusp. And it seems to be, with a minority government here and a minority government now in Ottawa, maybe things are, or maybe the tree's shaking a little bit. 
uh, it's been experience, of course, I'm a political scientist by training, and when you look at history, you know, where significant legislative changes and national and provincial programs took place, often it's happened during minority governments where everybody has to listen to everybody else yeah. to come up with a path that can be acceptable to the whole group. But I think, you know, for people with disabilities, you know, having them out in the community, first of all, in school and, and in jobs and, and uh, working and being visible in the community, it becomes a chicken and egg argument. If they're not out and about and making personal connections with people, then there's no, you know, someone will, I'll go into a business and say, why don't you put a ramp on the front step there? So people get, well, we've never had a person in a wheelchair come to our restaurant before. Well, but that's let me tell point. you, it's like the jungle drums. <laughs> if, you, if you build the ramp, yeah. we'll, we'll spread the word and, and, and people will come. But they they don't come because they know it's not accessible because somebody else tried yeah. to get in there and didn't uh, yeah. have success. And on the other t hand as well about attitudes and perceptions, I think again we're getting better at that but there's still a lot of, it's like racism, it's just under the surface a little bit. You know, when you meet a, a stranger uh, 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 without a disability or at least without a visible disability, you might say, you know, you know, what's your name and where are you from and what do you do for work? Yeah. Well, they meet a person with a disability, they might ask in their name where they're from and then the next question is, what happened to you? <laughs> yeah, how did, how did you become, you'd yeah. be surprised, like I'm sitting in the mall all having lunch and people that I do not know will come over and start asking me the most personal question. Now I have two choices. I can try to be <laughs> diplomatic and educate them about disability concerns or I can say, you know, Take you know that that's not really, uh, you know, any of your business. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so so it's a challenge at times and and not all people with disabilities are saints either and not all are diplomats. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sister taught me a good phrase, you know, something like I out in the parking lot loading my wheelchair and, and and a senior citizen would come shuffling over with the game and ask you, do you need any help, sir? And they obviously wouldn't be, but instead of being negative, I said, you know, I just say, well, no, but thank you for asking so that they get a little recognition that they went out of their way to ask, but I don't want them messing around with my left <laughs> yeah. just to make them feel good. So so That's part of that is the inner, the way people interact. And like I said, as, as people get familiar and they, they actually have friends and fam and with new medical cha changes, you know, neuroscience and all mm. of the other things, mm. more people are surviving longer with se serious disabilities, you know, strokes, head injuries, uh, what, all kinds of examples that didn't survive before. So mm. they do need access to services and supports and they do need to have a quality of life. Mm. But if you have, you know, most people who don't have an immediate family member don't know a lot about disability, but once you get to know or yeah. if somebody in the family becomes disabled, suddenly accessibility becomes a bigger issue yeah. or, or, or the idea, well, yeah, you know, we want to go out to a restaurant. We'd like to go to a place that he can go to, you know, yeah. so, so it's all built on that education and awareness, but education and awareness by itself won't cut it. We need legislation. We need more awareness of what you were talking about of the wellness concept. We need fairer economic distribution of resources so that people can have at least the basic necessities and, and structure our economy in a way that that can take place. Mm. And, and we need people with disabilities to feel that they're part of their community. They're not a charity case. They're not somebody to be pitied or, uh, you know, uh, uh, distressed over. We just, what we want is a hand up to be able to be, it doesn't mean that every person with a certain disability is going to need the same support. Yep. Some people need very little. Some people will need a lot. But if we balance the system in a way that we can enable people to get what they need to, to be self-sufficient and independent and to reach their potential, the whole society will benefit. Because we look at the population demographics in New Brunswick. Mm -hmm. We're, we're going to have in the next 10 years a huge problem filling, we already have it now, filling jobs that are coming uh, vacant. So looking at underrepresented populations uh, that are not adequately represented in the labor force are going to be Necess a necessity, not an option. So, you know, visible minorities, uh, women, uh, people with disabilities, older adults who may choose not to retire as, as early as they would have otherwise. We need to encourage the system to have the capacity to uh, enable people to help themselves. I, li I like the, um, uh, the U.S. Marines motto, uh, improvise, adapt, and overcome. You know, the, the, it doesn't matter what problem you can throw at me about somebody with a particular type of disability. Like I said, with the right philosophy and the right 
objective and the right um, environment, uh, you know, we can enable more people with disabilities to have a decent standard of life. And I don't think, uh, you know, the general public um, would fight against that concept. And we just have to figure out how do we educate and motivate the bureaucrats and the politicians mm. to make this a higher priority in uh, where they put their focus on rejigging the, in, the, the mm. system. And in many th things, it's not a question of more money, it's just how you do it, like designing public buildings or, or uh, apartment buildings or, or whatever. It, if you build the accessibility features in at the time of construction, it's little to no cost. But if you try to take a, a building and retrofit it later, mm. it's huge cost. So mm. if we had legislation with standards for barrier-free access, it wouldn't be. You could age mm. in place. You wouldn't have to send people prematurely to nursing homes. Yeah. They could live in their own home because it was designed as they aged or became disabled later in life. The features of the house could be adapted easily because the basic design was yeah. barrier free. And in that spirit, there was a story in uh, Brunswick News just a couple of days ago out of Sussex. Um, you know, the headline is, it's a day-to-day -day thing. Family wants more awareness about accessibility. Mm -hmm. And it was about taking their daughter, who's in a chair, to uh, the mall in Sussex. And in one of the stores, I think it was a Sobeys, had uh, put up um, some barriers, those metal posts, yes, um, because of uh, shoplifting. Yep. And but they didn't leave enough gap between the posts for a chair to fit through. And she has a motorized chair. There's a picture with it. Mm -hmm. Someone did point out that um, one of the posts lifts out, and you can get out that way. But that means you have the ability yes. <laughs> to leverage and lift the post. Plus, out. you have to know that it lifts out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that stuff. So, so that, that reinforces what you're saying that, you know, we need some legislation to support the design elements so that change gets implemented that way. Two things come to mind pretty quick. Um, one of them was our language. So uh, I'll do an injustice to the fellow who has this great Facebook page called Don't Diss My Ability. Right. Yeah. Um, which I thought, oh, good, nice play, you know, because we've yeah. been in and around that for decades yes. now. And say, so even as you talk, I'm thinking, yeah, that damn word disability, disability. And it's the opposite. It's like, but, but we can do this. But that sounds like a, a sell job, sort of. we got to convince someone rather than it's just the premise. Like, but this is. You don't have to sell someone you can do things. You can just do things. So do you have any thoughts after, you know, a, a lifetime of dealing with that language? How do, how do we get past framing it that way? Well, I'm not... Uh, a big fan of getting too politically correct about language or focusing only on language. The, the language evolves over a period of time. Okay. I can remember growing up, for example, you know, the uh, Rotary Club approached about being the, the Timmy for the local Easter Seals campaign for crippled children. I didn't want to be seen as a crippled uh, kid, even though I had a disability. And, you know, so that. evolving from crippled to handicapped, and, and which was a, the origin was putting your hand out with a cap to collect money yeah. oh, and then disability to me disability is fine but you get people reaching so far to be you know li linguistically correct you know the ab the differently able bodied you know yeah. uh, whatever yeah. I would focus instead on, I want you to see me as a person, hmm. and maybe there's some characteristics about me as a person that require some considerations, you know, if I'm using a wheelchair to get into the place, if it's got a, a, a level entrance, that's not only good for me in the wheelchair, that's good for the mother in the stroller, it's good for the delivery guy <laughs> delivering the bottles of, of pop to put in the, uh, yeah. the, the machine, uh, or, or whatever we're talking about. So a lot of the design or responses to uh, people, it's the same as anybody else. So, you know, people with disabilities, you know, they want to be loved, they want they want to have hope, they want they want to participate in their community, they want to feel a sense of belonging, they 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 want to have opportunities to travel, they want a chance to have a family in, in many cases. Right. So the dreams and hopes of every individual are different. And for people with disabilities, they have the same mix of dreams and hopes, but they have other barriers that they have to figure out how do they manage those barriers uh, in order to achieve their goals. And some, they can take the responsibility to themselves, but others are integrated into the situation yeah. of the environment and the and the community and the, the workplace or what have you where other people have to make decisions to include them and what's so interesting is we all need help 
<laughs> like we're all integrated, and that's what's so striking about uh, just because the disability might be visible mm -hmm. <clears throat> doesn't mean it's any different from able-bodied. <laughs> because we all need help somewhere because we're strong at these things we're not so strong at these yeah. things it's team you know so you're good with passing the ball you're good with shooting the ball so together you make a pretty strong team well also you know when you're young as a baby you rely on your parents yeah. and you get older and you can be self-sufficient and maybe later in life you're going to need certain supports so like you said everybody needs supports but I'm also glad you raised the idea of, of, of visible disabilities because there's other disabilities <laughs> that are not visible exactly. uh, whether it's you know somebody dealing with autism or mental health mental problems health issues. or learning disability what yes. have you so a lot of people when we talk about uh, disability issues they think automatically well somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who's blind with a seeing eye dog yes. there's such a range of people and even within each of those disability categories yeah. there are people with different like myself I use a wheelchair but I can walk a few steps with canes yeah. uh, I can't go very far I can't yeah. stand very long but it, I'm in a better position for example than somebody who's paraplegic or quadriplegic who doesn't have that yeah. uh, ability to integrate the the, uh, the uh, way they respond to task of daily living however like you said everybody has strengths and and, and everybody has areas where they need support from others mm. and if we just look that in the bigger concept of everybody instead yeah. of singling out people with disabilities there. and being different yeah. uh, then uh, like I said once you get to know people as people all of the other stuff falls away and you, you figure out creative ways to address the obstacles yeah. and, and reduce the barriers yeah. and because you're helping a friend or a family member or, or, or somebody that you feel uh, you want to have meaningful contact with in your lives and whether you're an employer or, or a politician or uh, you know a hotel owner a restaurant owner business person whatever if we all just made a little bit of effort to get information about how to include people instead of excluding yeah. people I, I think our society would be uh, uh, better for everybody in, in that context and and we all have the ability to be helpful in some way to address the challenges uh, for people with different disabilities. Yeah, and that, that's the concept of overall wellness, you mm -hmm. know, that everybody um, has a relationship, which makes me slide sort of to its opposite, because sometimes the opposite tension creates a nice space for where the solutions will come from. Okay. So in the UK, I believe this summer, they did a major study or a major study came to fruition and found that their one of their largest, if not the largest social issue they had was loneliness. Yeah. And they created a Department of Loneliness and a Minister of Loneliness. So you can ask, you know, is that going to be the solution to the problem? Do you need to create another layer of bureaucracy or can change come from the top down? But somewhere in all of our populations, as we define them up to try to categorize, to then try to see where the mesh is, because we, we label everything and then we've divided it. Now we're working hard to figure out how to pull them all back together. A common theme like loneliness um, has to be part of the disabled narrative and it, it has to be because it's already segmented by design almost by how legislation passes yeah and, and the yes. second thing to play with is can legislation create change because that's implicit in all your stuff is like we need legislation to create change or can some of it just kind of happen if people's awareness uh, goes up? I, I don't think it's an all or nothing. I think you need legislation for certain uh, initiatives in order to create a foundation of an environment that enables things to happen okay. and also to provide in some ways the funding to initiate the uh, uh, process. But when you talk about loneliness, uh, that's a huge uh, issue. In our modern society, families in the old days all lived together and uh, multi-generations living even in the same house, uh, yep. you know, but as the economy has changed and the global economy, you know, uh, uh, families are split up, not just in the same community, but they're all over the world, literally. So mm. we have uh, in Fredericton, for example, a significant uh, demographic of older adults who are living alone with no immediate relatives anywhere close by. They don't know their neighbors. They don't know uh, the services and programs that are available in the community. Uh, they're not necessarily following good diet. Uh, because they're uh, by themselves then you get into issues of depression and and, and things that can lead to uh, uh, you know health issues and 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 again cost to the community so you know I serve on the age-friendly community advisory committee for the city of Fredericton and we've been trying to promote things like a good neighbor program to you know talk to your neighbor next door maybe if you notice there's there 
steps aren't shoveled, go over and shovel them out and, uh, you know, don't wait to be asked, uh, you know, or find out who your neighbor are, are so that if you haven't seen them for a while, you can check up on them or t give them your number so that mm -hmm. if they feel they want to talk to somebody or if they fell and needed help, but yep. know, didn't need an ambulance, but they just yep. needed, or if they wanted to go to lunch or something, or you're going to pick up your groceries, maybe you can take a neighbor with you to, to, to help them uh, get their groceries at the same time. And the same for people with disabilities. If they're on a majority of them on low fixed incomes, they don't have the resources for transportation, they don't have the resources for uh, 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 housing, uh, uh, and, and like I said, if they're in poor housing with uh, problem neighborhoods, whatever, they, it may not lend itself easily to get uh, connections with other people who would be a positive influence in their mm -hmm. lives as, as opposed mm -hmm. to a negative influence. So. Uh, I sort of like, I hadn't heard that uh, uh, initiative in Britain about the uh, Ministry of Loneliness, but, you know, it, it does make sense to me because, again, if people cascade down a minor problem or minor level of loneliness and depression can quickly move into a very serious one that requires hospitalization, mm -hmm. mental health uh, supports and, and, and medication and treatments and what have you, which, you know, I would rather spend my tax dollars on preventative health and wellness initiatives and supporting people with a decent quality of life instead of waiting till they get in crisis and send them to the justice system or the mm. hospital system where you know it costs a thousand dollars a day to put them in a hospital bed but they won't give them fifty dollars a day to be able to to live with dignity in the community yeah. <laughs> uh, in a related way um, because it seems like um, the larger narratives are slowly working their way down to common denominators rather than all these projects or subdivisions, mm -hmm. down into common denominators like loneliness. New Zealand, I believe, um, early last spring, passed the budget based on wellness. Yes. And that was the headline that, that flashed across in all yes. the detail. So to find a theme or, um, I want to say a value, but it's like a heart vibration, technically. Yes. So when your passion is to go in that direction towards wellness, or how do we combat loneliness, it's very different from how do we nurture the GDP. Or how do we improve the business case and then the money trickles down? The so it sounds like some narratives in some places are slowly shifting to an area that actually will create the change that we've been claiming we've wanted for the past 50 years. Yeah, but you look for, you know, New Zealand's a great example. When the political leadership has a certain objective and goal in mind, they can make rapid progress through legislation and, and priority of budget spending to achieve uh, goals that are compatible with that new agenda. And they also are doing things on climate change. They're doing things on mental health. They, they also uh, were uh, quick to move when they had the shooting at the mosque uh, to, to, to uh, eliminate the uh, 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 automatic weapons. Compare that to the United States, where yesterday or the day before there was the shooting at the high school in California, while a bill was on the floor of the Senate to try to get background checks, a simple solution that was not that onerous in my opinion mm. and senators for the one party were speaking against it and stopped the, the resolution passed in the House of Representatives, but the Senate uh, killed the bill literally while children were being shot at a school while the senators were talking in opposition to that bill. So when political leadership gets a message or a philosophy and, and decides to act on it, yes, we can see significant change. Like the, the federal disability legislation took a year and a half with multiple engagement of the community, which was one of the first time I've ever seen it in all the years I've been where uh, people got a chance to participate in meetings and, and offer ideas. And instead of doing stuff to them, they were doing it with them, which is a unique concept. And, and I think we need the same thing in government at the provincial level, because Again, I, I said earlier about preaching to the converted, you know, uh, a lot of disability organizations and other social agencies are having conferences and workshops and they're talking to each other, but they're preaching to the converted. And, and we, we have meetings, for example, we have an annual legislative breakfast. We have the premier and, and uh, MLAs there. And just as soon as the official programs over there out the door, while well, the rest of us are spending the rest of the day talking about strategies, about how to fix problems. Not We don't want to whine and complain about what's wrong with the system. No. We need to come up with creative, uh, sustainable, uh, appropriate solutions that people can buy into and make the commitment to take action. I, I'm sick and tired of studies and reports <laughs> and commissions. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to see concrete 
measurable objectives and, and public transparency and accountability to make sure that the objectives are actually followed up on. So uh, we're working, for example, with the Premier's Council on a new disability action plan. So we don't just make a recommendation. We say which department or agency needs to do it, how much time they have to do it, and approximately what the budget implications uh, would be. And like I said, some things don't cost any money. Yeah. Some things cost little money. Some things will take more money and more time to, to deliver. But unless you have the leadership and the political will at the at the top where people have the authority to, to allocate budgets and resources and and legislation, mm -hmm. then all we're doing is picking around on the fringes and getting the low hanging fruit here and mm -hmm. there and having projects that get funded and make some progress and then the project funding ends and you go back to the same problem mm -hmm. you had before. So we need long term commitments and sustainable funding and we need not just awareness and support and principle, we need action. We need concrete, measurable action sustained over a period of time if we want to see a dramatic improvement in the quality of life and the equitable opportunity for people with different disabilities. There's a lot right in what you just said. Um, what pops to mind quickly is uh, voters need to change why they vote because then politicians will change why they're doing the legislation. Yeah. So if voters are still showing up saying, can you get me a job or can you do what I want you to do? Because that's, to me, one of the big stopping points to a 20-year systemic change that's going to take. If voters keep looking for a quick return on their vote or they get their road paved or they, they get the cookies, basically. They see it as a cookie distribution system. <clears throat> um, and there's a lovely F. Buckminster Fuller quote that I like to use a lot and it popped into my head as you were talking yeah. You cannot, because you talk about all these projects and then four years later, we're back where we started. Um, we've done that since more or less the mid 80s. Uh, the Equal, o Equal Opportunities Act in 66 did affect effective change and good change for New Brunswick. Somewhere in the mid 80s, early 90s, that started to lose its impact as municipalities grew in strength and, and needed more autonomy mm -hmm. and technology changed an awful lot of things too. <clears throat> and we're in a cusp now in this environment of uh, minority governments. There's a window there with minority governments, like you said, like there's a need to start to work together again. So will voters vote for a politician who is cooperative in their approach rather than conflict-based in their approach? Meaning you vote for me, I sit at the table, I'm the one that decides where the cookies go, compared to I don't have a clue, but I know how to get everybody in the room because that's my job as a leader. And then you guys can all work together to figure out what the solution is. Do you think voters are finally ready to let go of how they've always voted, which then brings a new type of politician who will surface like, oh, I can work with community that way. I can't work with community this way because we have that negative narrative of, you know, all the decisions are actually made by people that are never elected. Yes. And, and so are, are we on the cusp of with minority governments and with more awareness and greater communication, good or bad, through social media, that maybe we can actually have a shift equal to what happened in 66? I think what gives me optimism for the future is when I look at the younger generation, because back when I was growing up, you know, families voted for one party or the other, and it was like a generational thing. If your grandfather voted one side of the yeah. house, they the family kept on voting no matter what that Yep. party did or didn't do i think today there's more willingness like it's, there's it's not just in politics but it's in the economy too like lack of brand loyalty they're starting to be a little more uh, aware of what's being done and what isn't being done you look at greta thunberg uh, the young uh, swedish girl and and what she's been able to achieve as a single individual young person in creating awareness and and sparking debate but there's still a problem in in my mind that most voters they don't really understand even how the democratic system works you know we get calls at our office where people don't even understand the difference between federal jurisdiction and provincial jurisdiction or municipal jurisdiction and during an election campaign, I, I think a former prime minister uh, said that's not the time to try to explain, uh, you know, complicated things. I think we need to get back to the basic. When I was in school, uh, we had civics uh, course and we learned about the different levels of government, the Constitution, the British North American Act. We learned about the judiciary and, and what it was uh, uh, responsible for. We learned about voting and, and how to uh, uh, inform yourself about uh, 
you know, what way to vote, for example. And I, what puzzles me over and over again, again, as a political scientist, is how people often are voting against their own self-interest and, and not recognizing that there are new options, new way of doing things. And in fact, again, getting back to that element of change, that, you know, changing political loyalties or changing uh, the accountability, I guess, of politicians. A lot of people feel, you know, uh, they have a lot of disrespect for politicians. I respect a lot of them. Most of them got into the politics, you know, because they wanted to make their community and their province better. But the problem is once they get elected, their biggest focus tends to be on getting reelected. And so I, I'm a believer in term limits, for example, so that people could stop focusing on getting reelected and start focusing on what's good for the community and mm. good for the province, good for the country. Mm. And I think we would all be better off and there'd be uh, less of this tribal opposition where groups are, they're not talking about the issues and the solutions it's throwing mud at each other's tribe and 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 especially with social media where people aren't held accountable you know posting under false names and and third party advertising that's uh, trying to undermine a particular uh, initiative i i would like greater accountability for me i think social media should uh, uh, require people to post their own name if they're going to put commentary on there or advertising or what have you so that they're they're held accountable and i also think people should be listening and looking and and researching what do they see as the options for progress and solutions that they would support and don't wait till election day to vote because of the last poster you saw going into the poll hmm. but look at uh, political parties and and like you said earlier i think one positive thing of a minority government really does require the the different uh, parties to to work more closely together than they traditionally do when there's a majority mm. uh, government and and the uh, sometimes the in the province like new brunswick for example political ideology is not that different it's more the individuals and the experiences they've had before they got into politics and the the opportunity to educate and make them aware so that they could shift their uh, priorities. And unfortunately, uh, I think too much emphasis gets, uh, you know, the people who already have access to the levers of power, the, you know, the big corporate uh, agenda uh, overtakes the, uh, yep. the social agenda where there's <clears throat> a lot more room for creativity and initiatives mm -hmm. and looking, you know, to other jurisdictions, whether it's New Zealand or Britain or what have you. Mm -hmm. I don't think we have to reinvent the wheel all the time. We need to cherry pick good ideas and try out new approaches because if we keep doing the same thing as we've done in the past we shouldn't be surprised we get the same problems continuing <laughs> yeah. specific to your role as chair um do you see a window for shifting legislation like you've described so well with the minority government given um, like do you have the ear of the people's alliance and do they have the ear of the green party and will those six seats ever dare work together in order to make the other two um, see that this is a good, like the common good. So is there some, and it's not leveraging, I'm not talking about leveraging, I'm talking about access, and because it is a minority government, and because they are going issue by issue, is there a greater opportunity for your work to work with those six to then get that on the floor of the ledge, rather than, you know, Mr. Kuhn was all by himself once upon yeah. a time and he couldn't get anything yeah. going. Uh, does, does that give you opportunity? There, there's certainly uh, uh, better dynamics with that, but what we tend to do is not only submit our ideas and recommendations to government, we immediately then, unless it's like if we're replying, we've been asked to review an internal cabinet document about something, we can't share that yeah, with other, but, but when we're submitting ideas like this proposed provincial accessibility legislation, which isn't just talking about built environments, also talking about employment, communications, education, you know, a, a, a scope of, of issues. Uh, we'll, we not only arrange for meetings with the Premier's office and the Premier and, and uh, politicians, we will copy that same package and send it to every MLA, uh, for, including the opposition, because we've learned over a period of time that whoever's in government today may not be in government tomorrow. Yeah. and we're nonpartisan in approach. Uh, sure. We don't. It's it's not that we're we're not trying to break down or overthrow the government. At the same time, we're we want to work with anybody who wants to make things 
better for the future uh, for people with disabilities. So it makes sense to us to interact and communicate and educate uh, the members. And we've done briefing sessions with uh, opposition uh, members. And like I said, we send copies of the documents. And when we have special events, whatever, we invite them to come so they get exposed to uh, people with different, different ideas and different directions. But mm. it's a challenge because you're not naive. You know that you know a, the premier or any particular minister. We go in for a meeting, and yes, everybody's positive, smiles, and supportive. And as we're leaving to go out the door, there's another group coming in on an entirely different topic and different yeah. priority that will be vigorously lobbying their perspective yeah. on something else. So I can appreciate for a, a lot of the. Uh, uh, elected officials and as well as the senior bureaucrats in government it's it's kind of hard to figure out the wheat from the chaff you know who's being honest and who's giving you good information and uh, the other interesting thing about the premier's council we don't deliver programs so we're not trying to get a bigger budget right. we're not trying to deliver programs or get funding for something we really do operate in as much as we can in an objective way to try to give good independent objective advice irregardless of who the government of the day is yep. Yep. and we've worked over the years with different governments but i think that hopefully gives us a little more credibility and because we also represent all disabilities and all age groups and we've got you know active contacts yep. in all of those uh, constituencies when we're talking to government like i said we're not trying to get more funding for our program or for our empire to hire more staff. Uh, you know, we're really there trying to do what's right for the people of New Brunswick, what's right for the people with disabilities, and for goodness sakes, what's smart and common sense and right for politicians and bureaucrats to make some good choices going forward that may be better than some of the choices they made in the past. <laughs> That's actually a great spot for us to end. Yeah. <laughs> Would um would you have a quick final thought that, before we sign off? Because that, that was great, like to the point, focused. Well, I, I just want to say again, Dennis, I, I really appreciate that. I think this is the first year or first time in 40 years of uh, advocacy that I've had an opportunity to have an interview with somebody that lasted more than uh, a minute and a half uh, or, and uh, to have an opportunity to discuss some of the, the information in a little more depth. And also the biggest message I want to leave to people is don't get caught in doing the same things as we've always done in the past. Look to what's going on in other jurisdictions. I constantly am on the internet and reading books and, and talking to people from other jurisdictions because we don't have a, a monopoly on, on intelligence and creativity and common sense. And the reality is for disability issues, they're the same no matter where you're from, uh, the concerns, the barriers, the obstacles, but also the solutions, the, the ways to make things better and how to be doing stuff that aren't just project based, but long term, sustainable, uh, practical things that make a difference and make things better. And I go to work every day uh, and think every night, what can we do tomorrow that will make things better than they were yesterday? <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. And thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. We're done. Hey, thank you. That was awesome, man. Thank you.